Uh, good evening. My name is Mark Monahan from Aquacast, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for our webinar, Modern Casting Techniques in a COVID-19 World. Our featured speaker is Dr. Callie Tileston from Stanford Children's Health in Northern California. Dr. Tileston received her medical training at the USC Keck School of Medicine in Los Angeles. She had both her orthopedic residency and pediatric ortho fellowship at Stanford. She specializes in complex fracture care, neuromuscular disorders, scoliosis, and orthopedic treatments. She's the author or co-author of numerous publications, including three this year. Her mantra, there is nothing more rewarding than helping a patient heal and thrive, is ideal for her position as a surgeon and professor at Stanford Children's Health and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. We also would like to invite you to stick around for a special webinar offer at the conclusion of the presentation. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Tileston. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I appreciate you all coming uh, and spending your evening with us. Um, I'm actually very excited to give this talk. Um, so I'm a pediatric orthopedist um, at Stanford Children's Health. Um, I'm going to talk today about casting techniques uh, during COVID-19 and where we are today. So when I was first asked to do this talk, I was a little concerned because um, cases were going down and Europe was opening back up and a lot of the um, states around our country were opening back up. Um, but now we're sort of going back into this uh, third wave, you might call. Um, and so I think that this talk is very appropriate and something to think about as we're going into the winter time. So, advance my slide. so uh, here are my disclosures. I don't have anything relevant to this talk. Um, I do receive some grant funding from some of our organizations. Um, and then I'm on uh, several boards and committees. So the objective today is to first discuss COVID-19 and how it survives on the skin um, then we'll talk a little bit about appropriate hand hygiene, many of the things which we already know. And then uh, we'll go into casting techniques that allow this type of hygiene, including hand washing and bathing. So uh, COVID, the survival of COVID-19 on the skin is actually quite remarkable. It actually can survive uh, nine hours on average. Uh, this is comparable to influenza A, which on average survives about 1.8 hours. So it's a significantly longer amount of time. Um, and this, was, this is without any hand washing or other intervention. So it has a markedly higher stability on human skin than that of the flu. Um, interestingly though, uh, you can see that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is deactivated um, within 15 seconds when you use ethanol treatment or appropriate uh, hand hygiene. So this uh, quick inactivation is really important when we're thinking about kids that are going back to school, kids that are going back to activities, adults that are back at work, um, and um, you know even going out to dinner or uh, interacting in the world around us. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I actually really like it. Um, it shows the different forms of COVID transmission. Um, the virus is transmitted uh, not through the skin itself, but it's uh, transmitted by traveling through the air um, and uh, getting into the mucous membrane. So the, frequently that occurs by us touching something and then putting our hands in our T-zone, which is sort of across our eyes and down our face. Um, and then this fomite, uh, contaminates our mucous membranes and allows it uh, to enter our body. So these um, red circles with the white in them are different ways that uh, uh, we can be infected by COVID-19. And then when you look at the crosses, these small circles, um, the smaller circles with the crosses, these are ways that we can uh, block this infection. And then the blue line down the middle is the difference between isolation and social distancing. So these are things uh, on the right that happens when we uh, don't uh, do appropriate hygiene. And then on the left is when we go out in the world um, and touch things and somebody else touches them later. Uh, we also know that 
uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus also survives quite a long time um, on surfaces if there's not appropriate cleaning. So it's important to wash our hands before we touch things and then uh, wash them immediately after we touch a surface as well. Um, it's really important to think of how do we transmit this virus. So when we look back at um, the transmission in China, over 70% of the human to human transmission was actually within families and close contacts. And so um, they've seen that the viral load is highest in the two days actually prior to symptoms. Um, and 44% of their transmission in China was during the pre-symptomatic uh, period. Uh, face masks are about 79% effective uh, in preventing uh, transmission, and then disinfection was 77% uh, uh, effective in preventing transmission. So this disinfection is incredibly important. And then even in our own homes, we, you know, in my house, um, we have uh, hand soap everywhere. We have um, sanitizer uh, immediate, that you use immediately when you walk in the door, um, anytime we handle food. So even in our own home, uh, we should be trying to uh, wash our hands appropriately. And then uh, because this frequent close contact uh, increases your likelihood of transmission 18 times um, over just uh, generalized transmission. So we've all seen the videos that about appropriate hand washing technique, but I want to go over it because it's important because casting really changes the ability to do this. So we need to be able to number one, wet our hands with water. Then we need to be able to apply soap to all surfaces and rub them throughout the hand. So on the palm surfaces, on the back, um, and then uh, rubbing this way. So when we're unable to do those things and when we just try to clean the fingertips, especially when a person is in a short arm cast, um, that actually makes it very challenging to try to maintain appropriate uh, hand hygiene. So um, uh, this is why I, as I've gone in, I've gone through COVID in the last uh, several months, I've tried to transition even more to the uh, waterproof casting material, if possible, in order to prevent uh, um, the ability of uh, COVID to stay on someone's uh, skin. So uh, hand sanitizers also work quite well in deactivating the virus, like I said. So as you go up in concentration, uh, the viral infectivity significantly goes down. But again, you need to reach all the surfaces of the hands. You need to be able to be the front, the back, um, and if it's covered in the cast, you're not able to get to those surfaces. So um, I am a big um, leader uh, in our group in terms of waterproof casting, um, and a lot of my partners use it quite a bit as well. Um, and when we talk to others, there's a lot of casting, waterproof casting uh, concerns. So I wanted to go over those concerns and sort of how do we mitigate that and how I mitigate it in my practice. So the first one and the one that's very important, especially to pediatric orthopedists is can we maintain, can we obtain and then maintain appropriate reduction of a fracture um, uh, comparable to cotton liner in a uh, waterproof casting material? So my answer to that is yes. I have used that for years, even before COVID. Um, I just make sure to use appropriate casting techniques. So we should all be using that in our practices. Um, you don't want to, so uh, I like this x-ray because it shows that there's not too much padding between the cast uh, outer liner here and the skin. There's very minimal uh, padding there that allows for a nice mold. Um, you want to have a nice cast index. So a cast index is the relative width of the cast in the coronal view, uh, so the front view here, relative to the side view. So if you take that, it should be no more than 0 0.7. So uh, and when I talk to my kids in my office, I say I want a flat pancake cast because a flat cast, a well-molded cast, um, one that has the bumps that I want uh, that shows uh, that I've pushed in the proper position actually makes a straight bone and holds it. So it's not the padding that is holding uh, your reduction, it is the casting technique. So very, very important, even despite using um, waterproof casting or non-waterproof casting, uh, we should always maintain good casting techniques. 
um, hygiene? Did, um, you know, I do have patients who uh, are concerned that, well, they don't actually want to shower because they're afraid they're going to damage it. And actually, I have I found that the skin um, tolerates the casting better um, for waterproof casting if they actually do shower, do get it wet, even do get in the pool. The kids that are in the pool, I'm in California, the kids that get in the ocean, their uh, casts are actually, and their skin is much cleaner if they actually do get in and, um, you know, take a normal shower, take a normal bath uh, every day. So it is, um, I do use it uh, as it is meant to be used. And I recommend that patients uh, use it as it's meant to be used. Um, it does allow for hygiene. They can wash their hands. Um, and uh, the one thing is, is you don't want to stick any um, hand sanitizer or soap into the cast itself. So um, as shown here in the picture, you can wash like you would normally wash, but you don't want to stick anything in it since it, especially a hand sanitizer or a chemical like that can cause a chemical burn. So um, I did have one child who did that. That's not a good idea. Um, but outside of that, just the normal soap that you would get in there with normal bathing uh, doesn't generally cause any skin uh, problems. Also, uh, now that we're in COVID, our children have to be um, outdoors. Uh, so my kids, uh, my preschooler has to go to school and her classroom is mostly outside. So they are making much more mud soup than they ever did, picking up leaves much more than they ever did. Um, and so it's important that after that, I can appropriately wash uh, their hands. So also there's a lot less activity because they can't go to the parks like they used to. Um, and so they're um, we're wanting to try to get them outside to be active so that they can still mean some, maintain some level um, of fitness and activity. Um, and so being able to wash their hands after they get dirty and act like kids uh, is really important. Um, also another important uh, sport, at least uh, where I live, is swimming um, because it allows social distancing. So a lot of people have their own pools. It's a way to exercise. Um, and you don't have to go to a park in order to enjoy that activity. So again, the, I cannot overstress the importance of technique. You again want to avoid too much padding. So what you see here um, is that you really only want to overlap 50-50. So if you use the three inch uh, roll, you, over, you have one and a half inches above and then you overlap the bottom one and a half inches and you need no more than that. Um, you do want to, outside of that, you want to pad the bony prominences, so over the ulna, between the thumb here, and then at the proximal part of the cast, I do an extra two wraps um, so that there is some padding around uh, the end of the cast. Um, but you really don't want to use too much padding, especially if you're trying to hold a fracture uh, in the proper position. Um, also important, as you see here, applying that cast stop tape. Um, if you don't have the tape, you can stick a plastic ruler or goniometer underneath the cast um, when you're taking it off. That helps protect the skin uh, because the Gore-Tex does heat up when you use a cast saw. So very important um, uh, to use that cast tape um, or use something to protect the skin when you take the cast off. So again, you really, really want a 50-50 split uh, when you put the cast on. Um, the problems that I find uh, that people have is when they want to wrap it with the same number of wraps and layers that they have with, uh, um, uh, with the normal cotton padding. I also don't tend to use a lot of padding in general except over the bony prominences in my normal casting because again, that prevents you from getting a good mold. Um, but uh, that is very, very important um, in this type of the, um, cast technique. Also, what I have found um, and uh, I use in my office is you can see this blue outline rectangle that I use. So on the thumb here, um, I use the two inch pad. You can use it a three inch um, if that's what you have, but I create this little um, four box square cut out. Um, and then that I put over the thumb and that creates a perfect little pad for the thumb. And then I do another one for the bottom. So I do a couple over um, and 
I, and it helps when I'm putting it on because the Gore-Tex nicely sticks to itself. So I don't have to worry so much about folding while I'm wrapping. Um, I know that there are some concerns about the wrinkling that actually doesn't end up being a problem because the Gore-Tex uh, sticks to the cast material and not the skin so much. But I find it easier to put it on smoothly and the, the casting uh, process just goes a little bit more smoothly. So again, you make this little cut and you can fold um, that flap up so that there's a little bit of extra padding there or you can just take it out uh, entirely and put it on that area. So that's a great way to pat around the thumb um, when you're doing that. And then um, what I wanna go over is when do I use AquaCast? So uh, previously I used it um, in all my short arm casts um, and I used it in my non weight bearing uh, short leg cast, but um, I know that there's some concerns about uh, getting it wet uh, when there's edges to it. So long arm casts, long leg casts, do I use that? And um, over the last seven months, I've increased it. Uh, my partners have increased their use of uh, those types of casts. So now I, for all upper extremity casts, um, I use, uh, so long arm or short arm, um, I do use the waterproof casting material. Um, I do have them shake it out above and I should have them shake it out like this just to allow it to drain out. Um, but I have not um, had any children that I've come back with um, their skin being too wet, especially in those corners. Um, and I basically, most of my uh, clinical practice is fractured care. Um, and so um, I haven't had that uh, experience and none of my partners have had that experience where we've had any settling of the water in the cast itself. Um, I do it on my uh, non-weight bearing cast, so my long leg, short leg, non-weight bearing cast. And again, I haven't had any pooling of the water in those um, corners or turns to the cast. Before this, I put it um, in my spica cast and I have continued to do that. Um, that is mostly because I am a mom and I cannot imagine if my um, child uh, had either urinated or pooped in the cast um, and I wasn't able to clean it and I had to come back to clinic or had to redo anesthetic in order to do a new spica cast. So even before this, when I did um, uh, spica cast or even do meta cast for the spine, um, so I use the waterproof casting material uh, for that. Um, I use the rolls. They also have um, a liner that you can use that some of my partners use. I just prefer the rolls and that's just personal preference. Um, and then since COVID, I've also started putting it on patients. So as a pediatric orthopedist, I do use a lot of K wires that stick out of the skin. So I don't use it when I would not allow the patient to shower normally. So if there are wires sticking out of the skin, you can't take a shower. So I don't use waterproof casting in that sense. Um, but if it's a post-operative patient and if they, if the incision is heal, healed, then I would let them wear a waterproof cast. Then I put Dermabond over the wound um, and then I allow them to shower. The other option, if um, they have an allergy to Dermabond, because I do have some kids who have sensitive skin, um, then I do not put the Dermabond on. I tell them to wait two weeks, which allows the wound to heal and then they can start showering. So again, those are ways that I've allowed my patients to be able to continue to maintain their hand hygiene um, while needing a cast. Um, that also, the, in the long leg cast, it allows them to shower themselves, bathe themselves. Um, I just want, uh, for me, it's the cost benefit ratio. Um, I haven't had any issues with the waterproof casting material. Um, and I want to keep the children that I'm working with and their families as safe as possible being able to maintain as much hygiene as possible. And so um, in my practice, we've gone to as much waterproof casting as I think is safe. So at this point, um, uh, I can answer any questions that you might have and we'll go over the webinar special offer um, that's available to you. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Towson. A lot, of, a lot of great information. Before we get into the questions, and there are a bunch of them, uh, we'd like to invite you to experience the benefits of, of AquaCast. And, and so we have a little bit of a webinar special. For those that are new, um, we're going to provide comprehensive in-service and training sessions, as well as enough product to get you started. Uh, for those already using AquaCast, we'd like to offer a new marketing support program that we've developed uh, along with our traditional training programs. 
And I know a lot of folks are interested in the CEUs and some application um, techniques. Please contact us at um, info at aquacast.com and we'll, we'll address all that information right away. You'll be receiving um, the, the presentation probably within the next two days and we'll have answers to any questions we don't get to tonight as well as information regarding the, the webinar special as well as uh, the CEUs. So, um, Doctor, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll start off on the first few questions. So, what do you tell patients about drying the cast after showers? So, um, so I don't tell them that they need to do anything special. Um, I let them just, you know, I tell them that they can hang their hand down and that allows the water to drip out. Um, if they're worried about the pooling in the elbow, again, I have them raise their arm up overhead um, and shake it down like this. Um, that being said, I can't imagine trying to get a two or three year old to do that. So um, uh, I think just normal airflow, but they don't need to use a hair dryer or anything in the cast uh, in order to uh, dry it at all. Okay, terrific. And then um, the next one we have here is, do you let your patients swim in lakes and ponds and the ocean? So I do, I let them do all of those things. Um, in California, I'm in Northern California, so we're close to Lake Tahoe. So we have a lot of, I have a lot of patients who have second homes in Lake Tahoe. Um, I live in, I work in San Francisco. So a lot of patients are surfers. So they're in the uh, ocean a lot. I do tell them that once they get out of that water um, or even out of the pool, I ask them to rinse it out with clean water um, just to get any dirt, grime or anything that's gotten in there out. Um, and that has been very successful. Ter terrific. And then, uh, do the patients have to get the cast wet every day? No, they don't have to. I mean, my kids don't shower every day or bathe every day. So um, I would just say do your normal bathing techniques. Um, but I do try to make sure that they know that they should be getting it wet at least every once in a while um, because that's the purpose of the cast. Um, so they don't have to get it wet every day. Um, but I do encourage them just to use their normal showering bathing techniques that they use. Okay, terrific. And then this is one you may have addressed earlier um, about holding a reduction. Does it hold a reduction as well mm -hmm. as traditional materials? Yeah. So there uh, was actually a study um, that was published in JPOB, so our Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics, um, and it did look at uh, the reduction and it does maintain um, uh, uh, the reduction as well. Um, so in the studies have, so the studies have shown that it maintains the reduction as much as a normal cast, uh, cotton cast padding does. Um, and in my personal experience, um, so I've been using it since basically AquaCast was, uh, it was available before when I was in training and then it sort of stopped and then now it's available again. And I've used it since it's come back and I haven't had any losses of reductions that I can contribute to the uh, casting material itself. Terrific, terrific. And we, we have a few questions that are coming in on insurance versus self-pay. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Bill, who's managing all, all of our questions on chat, jump in here. Yeah. Sure, so um, for, in terms of insurance and self-pay, it's, um, it's kind of a mixed bag and it depends on what part of the country you're in. Um, some insurance companies definitely do cover it. Other insurance companies do not cover it and people uh, do self-pay. Um, we have customers that do all sorts of different, um, different variety of different things in, in terms of addressing it. Um, if you're interested, we do have a procedure where you can submit several times to different your insurance uh, providers and they will give you a definitive yes or no so you will know what's gonna happen uh, for your customers or your patients in the future. Okay, thank you, Bill. And then uh, another one that came up is, uh, do you have more cast changes with AquaCast? Unscheduled um, cast changes. I would, have, I would say I have less cast changes, <laughs> um, especially in the summertime. Uh, but um, I guess even in the winter, because in the summer, kids will try to, if you don't have a waterproof cast, kids will either go to school and then put their hands in water or they jump in the pool or they have the cast covers, which are not 100% uh, effective. Um, sometimes they have holes in them. Um, and so I do have a lot less cast changes if I have a waterproof cast on, because then we don't have to worry about that. In the winter time when it's snowy and kids are trying to ski and do snowman and things like that, 
um, they get wet and you have to take them off. So um, I do a lot less cast changes. Um, I have a lot less issues with that. And it's also nice because when, as it, I tend to be, I tend to try to hold fractures and casts if I can at all um, and not operate on children. So I know with an aqua cast, or I should say with a waterproof cast, we use aqua cast. Um, with a waterproof cast, I know that over the weekend, they're not gonna have to go into the emergency room and potentially lose the reduction that I got. Um, so that is the other nice thing about keeping them in the waterproof cast is that I don't have to worry over the weekends, especially over a long weekend if it gets wet, that they may do something where we have to change the cast urgently. Terrific. And then um, one just came in. Do you need to um, dry the cast if it's below freezing outside and you're going out? And it kind of plays into what you just talked about with skiing. Uh, so I do not know the answer to that question. I have put it on kit. So my kids are on ski team. So they have a lot of friends who are in it while they're trying to ski. Um, I don't know what happens in the snow. I haven't had any reports that it freezes or that you need to dry it after that, but I'm not sure. Okay, uh, Bill, you wanna jump in there? Sure, just quickly. I mean, the skin would have to be at a freezing temperature for the water to freeze, obviously, that's yeah. against it. And there's so little water there, it, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, we've never heard of an issue and can, our Canadian market is one of our larger markets. So um, don't see any issues there. Okay, well, well, terrific. That, that kind of hey, brings us I think to somebody the raised their hand, actually. What's that? There, somebody raised their hand to ask it. Okay. Question. There's one more comment on uh, weight bearing. Why don't you use it on weight bearing lower extremity cast? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I worry when they're weight bearing, especially because I have little kids that are in weight bearing casts, that um, sometimes it rolls up. Um, so that's the only reason is because I have to use a thicker amount of padding for a weight bearing cast. Um, I do worry that it can bunch up and roll up. Um, I haven't. I have partners that use it for the weight bearing casts, and so and they haven't had it, but that's that's the reason why I don't use it personally. Um, Okay. And, and then if we have time for a couple more, does Aquacast have a stock in it or does it simply just roll on? How do you protect the edges? So um, they, you, um, you do have the Gore-Tex liner that's like a, like a pull-on pantaloon um, for the Spica. Um, I use the rolls just because then I only have to have one product and I prefer the rolls but I believe you guys have both. And then the edges don't actually need to be protected. So I just make sure to end um, the casting material um, away from the very edge. So I make sure that there's a thicker amount of padding and that um, the white liner, as you can see here in this picture, just extends a little bit over the edge. Okay. So just real quickly, there's a couple of questions about um, technique and you don't, you talked about some of it a little bit. The easiest way probably for people to see that is on our website. There's a bunch of videos mm -hmm. that show them how to, different techniques for cuffing, different techniques for going around the thumb, around the elbow, all those um, bony prominences, that kind of thing. So I'm mm -hmm. very the simplest thing there. Um, yeah, then there was one more question on, um, you mentioned COVID survival rate on the skin. Mm -hmm. It's interesting information. Any thoughts on COVID survival on the cotton liner versus the waterproof? Well, you can't wash the cotton liner, so um, I would assume that it survives just, uh, I can't remember what the time that it survives on cotton, um, so I'd have to look that up. But it is, um, I think, the majority of the day that it survives, um, whereas on the Gore-Tex liner, if you, if you wash it, then it should wash off, I would assume, just like any other surface. Yeah. So we have... We have one uh, about metacasts. How do you cut mm -hmm. out the abdomen and the edges? So I cut it out. So you have to be careful um, because you obviously aren't using the cast stop for that um, uh, part of the procedure. Um, but you, um, you just cut out your normal um, hole in the abdomen and over the scapula uh, for your metacast. And then um, what I do is I cut the, I do like, a, a, like an X-shaped cut and then I pull it out over the edges and then I use, um, we use the pink tape to hold it down and then I use an extra two inch roll on the outside that helps hold that, um, that uh, edge over um, around it um, so that it doesn't slip out. So that's how I do it. So again, I make an, uh, like a cross um, after I make my cutout and then I fold it back and then I use the um, another two inch roll of casting fiberglass material 
to sort of hold it so that it sticks down. So that's how I get it to have a nice edge. Um, I use the larger rolls for the Metacast, so um, because then I can really nicely provide an edge to that um, because you're cutting out for the legs and the armpit. So um, I use the largest rolls that they have for the Metacast specifically, and also for the torso part of the Spica cast. Okay. All right. And then are there any studies that show the equivalence of holding reductions between padding and aquacast? Uh, yeah, there are, there's a couple um, that are um, non-sponsored studies that do show that they hold um, the cast reduction equivalently. Okay. And then uh, do you ever have small children pull a sh uh, the cast off? I'm assuming it's a short arm cast. Uh, well, as somebody who puts um, pretty strong molds on and believes strongly in the um, uh, 0.7 uh, cast index, um, usually they don't fall off. Uh, I would say that if they're falling off or a, ca a child is pulling them off, then that means that you are either using too much padding or your mold is inadequate. Okay. And then with, with short leg casts, have you had any pressure sores with Aquacast? No. Um, I would say that Aquacast um, sticks to itself really nice. So a cotton padding sticks to itself. Aquacast also sticks to itself. So I just put an extra couple um, U strips um, on the heel um, uh, so that they're, the heel is protected. And then again, at the end of the cast, I put an extra two wraps. So there's three wraps total at the toe and then up at the calf. Okay, and then there were a few questions about waterproof tape. Um, I, I, what tape are you using, Dr. Dawson? Uh, so I think they're not talking about the cast stop tape. I think they're probably talking about the pink tape. Um, so for my, um, when I do a spica cast or a meta cast, um, we call it pink tape, but it's the waterproof tape that we used to use even when we were trying to uh, pedal the, um, the spica cast previously, um, and they would make the it's it that would make at least the edges of our old normal padding casts um, waterproof. So if they spilled drinks on it or something, it would make it waterproof. Um, but it's called pink tape. Um, I don't actually know well, what. There's um, we have a lot of folks um, who do use that on on various casts, and there's a company out of New York, uh, High Tape H Y dash mm -hmm. Tape that makes a product that's that pink or that salmon colored tape that. Yeah that we hear a lot of, um, a lot of people do a great job of that. Um, what is the learning curve to learning how to apply the product? Um, well, I mean, I would say if you have somebody teaching you um, to not put too much on, then I find it actually easier to put on than the um, cotton padding because the cotton padding you can't have wrinkles in, whereas the AquaCast, the, um, accepts some wrinkles um, because it sticks to the fiberglass instead of the skin. Um, so overall, it's either equivalent or maybe a little easier to put on. Okay. And then are there any downsides to waterproof casting? Um, in my view, I would say... Uh, it's a loaded question there. <laughs> no, that's a, I know. I, I, you know, I, I, this is a talk for Aquacast, but I, I have to say that even if this wasn't a talk for Aquacast, um, I feel strongly about waterproof casting for the reasons that I said previously. So um, I don't see a lot of downside. I do not put them on when there's wires sticking under the skin because I don't want them in the water. So I want to make it as hard for them to get their cast wet as possible. But outside of that, I don't see a huge downside for waterproof casting. Okay. All right. Well, well terrific. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, um, we had slotted in 30 minutes and we're a little bit over here. So uh, um, what I'd like to do is just kind of wrap it up. Um, we'll, a lot of questions have come in about getting a copy of the webinar. We'll have it um, automatically emailed to uh, through Zoom to everybody that has registered and attended. And that'll go out within the next two days, I believe. So you'll get an exact copy of all of this right here. Um, if you want more information about any application techniques or anything um, regarding the, the webinar offer, if you will, go to info 
at aquacast.com or our website at aquacast.com and we'd be more than happy to address all those questions. Um, CEUs for certain um, application specialists uh, are available for this webinar and just email us at info at aquacast.com and we'll address those uh, as, as we get those. But um, uh, Dr. Tyson, thank you so much. This was great information for all of us and uh, on behalf of our entire team and all the folks that have joined us, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, you know, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, by all means, reach out to us. We'll try and address all the questions we haven't gotten to. Um, in the automatic response, but feel free to contact us at any time. So, all right. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.